Hi, I'm Steve. This is my fifth book, Guide to Living in a Democracy. Thanks for joining us. I want to tell you how I got started writing books. In 2006, George W. Bush said that he represented real American values. Well, a group of us decided to get together and determine for ourselves what are real American values as objectively as we could. We started meeting on the first Monday of every month, and we still are meeting on the first Monday of every month. And we explored the founding documents and looked into the backgrounds of the founders. We went through a number of books in many areas over uh, a long period of time. And we discovered that the founders were members of what was called the Enlightenment. And people who were members of the Enlightenment believed in rationality over passion. They believed in um, critical thinking over just believing what you're told. Uh, they studied the Athenians and their democracy, which was a model for them. They were aware of the philosophers of their time. Uh, John Locke, for example, uh, said that it could be justified to overthrow a government if it is unjust. Montesquieu talked about the branches of government that would work much better uh, to provide checks and balances. They all had a lot of respect for science. Benjamin Franklin was known as a scientist on both sides of the Atlantic. They um, were concerned about the inequality that leads to revolutions. And about that time in 1776, Adam Smith released his Wealth of Nations which is considered to be the beginning of modern economics. They were into spirituality or into uh, religion, most of them. Uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote his own version of the New Testament to leave out a reference to a divine individual. And they also had thoughts about what we to get today would consider to be psychology. Uh, James Madison, uh, for example, was concerned about passion over writing reason which governed the way that he wrote the uh, Constitution and Bill of Rights. My first book, The Future of Democracy, came out in 2016. It had three segments, Democracy's Past, Democracy's Present, and Democracy's Future. And if you want to know if my predictions about Democracy's Future are accurate, you may just have to buy the book. Now getting into this book, you may recognize this guy in the cover, that's Abraham Lincoln. And he changed our idea of democracy. That's why he had so much influence over, over this particular book. Uh, and what I mean by that is, if you recall, the first three words of the Constitution are, we the people. But what they meant by we the people was white guys, which was about 30 to 40% of the population. And Lincoln, when he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, changed all that. He actually expanded our definition of who are we the people, uh, the Blacks in our country. And they were about 10% of the population of about 30 million at the time of the Civil War. Now, getting directly into the book, the dedication is to the memory of my cousin, Nita Shechet, and she wrote a book called Disenthralling Ourselves, which is based on a quote from Lincoln. I wanna give you that quote directly. In Lincoln's annual message to Congress in 1862, he said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise to the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And what I think he meant by disenthralling ourselves is that the North thought they were right, and the South thought they were right. But when we wrote the Constitution, people were able to put aside their differences and come up with a um, statement of what their common uh, common purpose was or their common uh, theory was about how to run a government, which uh, was very, very difficult. It took them four months. So I want to um, start quoting from a few sections of the book, and then I'll comment on those sections. 
For those of you who have a copy of the book, we are on page one. This is the story of democracy. It also is the story of the deep aspiration within every human being to be recognized as a valid and worthwhile individual. It is about how that aspiration has been honored and dishonored throughout time. It is about how human dignity is essential to the success of democracy. And it is about how simple acts based on basic principles can make the world work for all of us. So in my view, the idea of democracy is not complex. It's fairly simple. We all as human beings seek recognition. And what happened as uh, we went from being in tribes to um, being in states, uh, to being in nations, we eventually got lost and our sense of dignity and self-worth was sacrificed to the larger entity, which was good from the point of view of survival. Um, no one can survive if you just put them out in the woods very long, at least most of us couldn't, but people lost their sense of being able to participate and be recognized <clears throat> for their individual talents and, and their individual talents and contribution. On page two, we each have a democratic impulse that recognizes the value of others and wants to collaborate, collaborate toward what works best for all. We also have an autocratic impulse that prefers authority and is more comfortable leading or being led. In human history, the autocratic side has been prevalent. So what I'm saying here is that when we look back at the way that we have evolved into having large states everywhere, most states have been autocratic. It was only really um, when our country was founded that um, people began thinking about it being a democracy. The word democracy uh, had not been used for 2000 years uh, before that, going all the way back uh, to Greek times. On page nine, when stuck in a mode of blame, we are unable to move forward toward a world that works for all. We only progress toward a democratic vision by focusing in concert with others, then following through on a plan of action. When the US framers wrote the Declaration of Independence, they listed their grievances, but mainly emphasized their vision of what a democracy would look like. Martin Luther King focused mainly on human dignity. He didn't complain about all the people that were pressing him and eventually they killed him, but that's not his main focus. He focused on his dream. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison. He wrote and spoke of a free society for people of all races. And eventually he became the president of the nation that had imprisoned him for 27 years because he emphasized that vision of people working together. Gandhi warned his followers of the harm that hatred would have on them. We're gonna get into that in just a minute, but those who engage in hate, which is maybe all of us, some of the time, uh, that hate may or may not affect the other person, but it definitely affects us. On page 11, cooperation is an essential element of survival. Those who study the behavior of animals and tribal humans tell us that cooperation is seen in both. Competition between individuals and groups is important for motivation, but cooperation is needed to build societies and governments that last. So when, again, going back to when we were um, in our most primitive state, uh, we cooperated in the hunt. And then as our nations, as our, as our situation turned into tribes and nations. Um, again, uh, we cooperated toward um, uh, creating the kind of world that we needed to survive, but people got kind of lost in that. So um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about how, how democracy basically um, got us back to the idea of cooperation, the idea that we could work together toward a common um, vision. On page 34, if we believe in democracy, we insist that no human being is superior to any other. We support others in maintaining their rights as we would want them to support ours. Democracy, by the way, is from the Greek for rule or government by the people. 
And uh, we, the people, I said at, at the beginning of our country meant only a few, but we've expanded it to more and more people over 200 years. And if democracy is to survive, in my view, we need to consciously expand it to everyone. On page 35, we all are flawed individuals. We can be consumed by judgment or recognize that imperfection is part of our nature. So we can come from a judgmental place toward others and ourselves. And I think if we are honest, we often are judging ourselves, our failures, uh, or we can come from a compassionate place. Is it easy to do? No, because we automatically uh, judge others and ourselves. I wanna try something. Uh, I call this a thought experiment. The quantum physicists use thought experiments. So let's try this. I'd like to ask you to think about someone who you really hate or judge. Just think about that person. You can even project it onto me if you like, I won't mind. And continue to have that feeling, continue to have that sensation that you are judging or hating someone. Just let that get a little deeper. And notice that as you do that, your breathing becomes more shallow, you become tense, and the more we do that toward other people, whether or not they know we're doing it, we actually are harming ourselves. Now, try this. Think of someone who you really like or respect or love, and notice that your breathing gets deeper. Notice that you start to relax more and more. Just keep doing that for a little while. And notice that nothing happened externally. Nothing made us have those feelings of hate, judgment, or holding someone else in esteem. But when we do that toward other people, we mainly are affecting ourselves. We aren't affecting other people necessarily. They may not know how we think about them. And it is true, of course, there are situations where we have um, overwhelming sense of joy and happiness and connection with other people, a wedding, for example, and there are wars where we, um, you know, where we have a sense of, um, of disconnection or hatred toward other people, but we have a choice most of the time, as we do in this moment, of where we hold our attention, where we put our attention toward other people. Let's try one more thing. Let's go back to that person who you hate or judge. Notice again how you're feeling because there's no such thing as just a concept. Our concepts actually are embodied in our, in our, in our minds and in our, um, in our, in our, in our, in our, and in, in our bodies. Um, think about that person one more time and think about, can you possibly bring a sense of compassion to that person? What would that be like? You might say no, but ask yourself, what would that be like? And the next question I have, or that you probably have is, what does this have to do with democracy? Well, going back to the people we talked about, Lincoln, Gandhi, Mandela, Martin Luther King, they, of course, focused on the problems of their time but they ultimately saw that there is a vision, there is a way of seeing the world and seeing other people. And the hope is that we can move past our hatred and that enables us to work together toward a common vision. Think about World War II. More people died in that war than any other war, but eventually former enemies got together and decided to, common, to focus on a common vision of how they would work together to make the world work. On page 40, this is the first guiding principle of democracy. The unique part of the American Revolution was not that it began in revolution, but the, the founders prescribed a viable path forward. So what I'm talking about here 
is constructive dialogue. At some point, when they wrote the Constitution again, um, some of the uh, founders didn't like each other. You may have heard of a guy named Hamilton, and uh, he and Aaron Burr didn't get along very well. But when they focused on their common vision is when they were able to move toward uh, creating the country that we all have with all of its imperfections. But when we consider what's going on around the rest of the world, we're not doing too badly, but we still for sure have a long ways to go. The second guiding principle of democracy, universal respect on page 48. When we are born, we feel connected to all we see around us, especially other people. What makes the company of young people enjoyable is their ability, ability to universally accept others. This is the state of mind we left behind to which we long to return. We all start in what we might call the amniotic sea, and we're pulled out from that. And I know when my daughter was born, she had this look on her face like, put me back. And I think we probably all have that look on our face, put me back. And then we spend the rest of our lives trying to get back to that amniotic sea, back to that sense of connection, to that sense of um, uh, self-esteem that we think we left uh, way behind. Uh, we do that when we join maybe an organization, um, maybe we do that with our family, <clears throat> and um, there are a number of ways to do that, but um, maybe when we accomplish something, um, but ultimately, a lot of the time, uh, we feel that we are lost, we feel that our lives are not, <clears throat> are not complete, uh, and I think partly it's because we go back to that sense of when we felt we really were engaged or part of everything. Third guiding principle of democracy, equal justice. This is on page 57. A primary difference between humans and other creatures is that we have morals or ideals about how to act. Most of us believe that people should be kind to others and treat them as they would like to be treated. But that standard often is breached by all of us intentionally or unintentionally. Thus, we need rules and laws that are rules sanctioned by society to remind us of the behavior required to live with others. Now, if you believe in the golden rule, raise your hand. And if you always follow the golden rule, keep your hand up. If you don't, put it down. You see the problem there? We have ideals about how we are going to interact with other people, but we rarely follow them. So, uh, we have laws. This is why society came up with laws, um, rules, which are laws that are actually put in, put in writing uh, to, to give us reminders. And it's very, very hard to follow all of them, uh, but they are in, the, in a just society. Uh, they, are, um, they are kind of common sense. I want to tell you about John Rawls, uh, probably the most famous person who wrote about justice. And this is what he said in his theory of justice. The principles of justice are chosen behind a veil of ignorance. And what I think he means by that is if we were to write laws that really were just, they would apply to everybody equally because when we see the world, uh, just like we did when we were first born, um, when we see it clearly, uh, we don't have preconceptions, ideas about who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad. And imagine that, um, just for a second, try this little thought experiment, that you have no history, that you have no idea about who you are. Just look at that for a minute. Look at that. Is that a possibility? Just try that out for a minute. And I see behind me there, there is a lamp. But if I was to be using the same type of view that I had when I was born, I would just be looking at that and being objective and um, not even having a word for that. So our words fall short of reality almost always. And we're gonna get into that in just a minute. Fourth guiding principle of democracy, commitment to 
truth. Page 69. Knowledge has practical value that directly affects our lives. As our model of the world becomes more accurate, so does the likelihood we will act in a way that enables us to thrive. But each step toward greater understanding requires getting, letting go of ideas that no longer work. Now, if you go out in the daytime and look up, you'll see that the sun goes around the earth. Obvious, isn't it? We talk about sunsets. Are we lying when we talk about sunsets? Well, with further observation over thousands of years, wasn't until about the 1500s that Copernicus started calculating and he realized that if the sun goes around the earth, then some of the planets are moving backwards. And he didn't dare say anything about that till he was on his deathbed, by the way. Um, about 50 years later, Galileo confirmed that through use of his telescope. But he didn't dare uh, talk about that because the Inquisition told him to stuff it, which he did. And um, he uh, eventually was vindicated, of course, we all know that the um, earth goes around the sun. But we have our ideas about things in our daily lives. And we hold on to those ideas. And it's only when, um, Often when, we're to, when, we're, when, it's, when it's clear to us that those ideas no longer work, that we start to change them. Now, what does that have to do with democracy? If we have ideas about people based on their color, on their religion, on their political party, then we're gonna be stuck often in our ideas about who they are. If we're willing to look past that, to actually look at the person, then we're going to recognize that there is a person that actually is behind all those concepts that we foist on people. And as we provide recognition for others, as I previously mentioned, we start to get recognized, get a sense of recognition for ourselves. Let's get into truth a little bit more here. Those of us who believe in science, which is most of us these days, know that uh, there is a theory that the Earth started with a big bang. They see that the, um, the universe is expanding. I should say the universe started with a big bang. They see that the universe is expanding, and therefore it came back to one point. Those of us who believe in creation also believe that it started all at one point. So imagine that everything started at one point. It's continuing to expand and continuing to expand and never ending. As we speak, it is continuing to expand. So truth is our idea right here, our little idea about the way things are that uh, we use to capture a moment in time or maybe a period longer than a moment, you know, maybe, maybe for years. But eventually, if we're open-minded, we start to see that the universe is like this. So now my hands are going out, encompassing the whole universe. Excuse me if I bumped you on the shoulder. And you can see that no matter how comprehensive our, our concepts, no matter how many words or formulas, or mathematical ideas we have about the world, there's no way they can encompass everything because it's continually changing. What does that have to do with democracy? Good question. Again, um, if we stick with our concepts and are unwilling to change them, then we are unable to, to um, participate in that vision of uh, democracy, which includes everyone. Fifth guiding principle of democracy, protecting our environment. Page 81. There has been a balance between people and their environments for most, most of the time humanity has been on earth. This was recognized by our earliest myths and traditions. What we took from the earth, we eventually put back 
including our own bodies. In the Bible, we are told, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. And in this moment, as we speak, we actually still are dust. I'm breathing in and breathing out. I'm part of the universe all around me. I eat, and so do you, I assume, and we do the opposite. So we still are constantly interacting with the world in a way we are very much a part of it. And one way to help us understand our relationship with our environment is to think of us living on a desert island. As we put pollution up in the air, it comes down right on top of us. As we throw our trash and uh, refuse out to sea, it comes back to us. So this is why, um, this is very general, of course, the book gets into it more specifically, but this is why we need to always be aware <clears throat> of um, everything we do to our environment because we are our environment in a very real way. Sixth guiding principle of democracy, fair elections. On page 93, fair elections are the basis upon which democracy is built may seem obvious to some of us, but if you think back to the 2020 election in our country, there were Democrats, Republicans, election officials, there were judges, Democrats and Republicans, all of whom confirmed that the election was fair. But some of us, because we listen maybe to what someone tells us, rather than thinking about um, what, um, what what really is happening? We don't really look look into what is um, reality based on an objective view. Some people still believe that um, that election was not right. Seventh guiding principle of democracy: freedom of choice. Page one hundred five. The freedom of everyone is intertwined. In democracies, freedom has a special meaning. Our choices must be balanced with our responsibilities to society. So there's no such thing as total freedom. If we were totally free, maybe we could just be left out in the uh, woods and I think the bears would have something else to say about our freedom. So um, the only way we have freedom is by having a structure to guarantee it. And that essentially is what our government is supposed to do. When it doesn't do that, then people tend to rebel. The eighth guiding principle of democracy, shared prosperity, page 117. An economy that really works benefits everyone. We have had a number of uh, writers, uh, economists, who believe in free markets. And they tell us that just leave everything alone and it'll be just fine. Well, free markets have resulted in child labor, they have resulted in, um, if you go back to the beginning, they've resulted in people being kings and uh, autocrats running countries because eventually someone rises to the top. So we need more of what I would call an economic flow. A lot of you will remember the, um, the crisis that we had in 2008. It was almost a depression and uh, people thought we were going to go into a depression. And instead, we had learned from that, and money was pumped back into the system. Unfortunately, most of that money went to people who already were at the top, but eventually some of the money got back to people who were <clears throat> at other levels of society. Uh, I'm not an advocate for just saying give people money. Eventually, we have to get people working and into the economy, which is what I think we all really want to do. I think we all really want to contribute to our economy, but some people are in a position where it's very difficult for them to do that. So we need job training so that we can increase economic flow and that everyone can contribute to the economy. The economy was top heavy in 2008 and nobody was happy with the result. People at the top were scared. Uh, people at all levels were scared, but if we have everyone participating, everyone who possibly can participating in the economy, then everyone does well, including those 
at the top because they are selling their goods and services to other people and money flows to them and they spend it and they hire employees and eventually it circulates uh, throughout society. And that's the way we, um, we, we have economic, um, um, economic flow and shared prosperity. Ninth principle of, of democracy, standing up for democracy. Page 132, when people or nations show obeisance to a person or political view that ignores the value of every human being, we don't just give those views a pass, but challenge them by pointing out how they threaten us all. So in our conversations, um, in our politics, uh, we want to make sure that we're confronting those views that people are unequal. And uh, we made a big step toward that when we uh, wrote the Constitution. And then again, um, when Lincoln issued the um, Emancipation Proclamation and uh, women were given the right to vote, we're moving toward that, but we haven't quite completed that. And there's a lot of resistance. There are those who hold on to their concepts, which are antiquated, uh, which really stand in the way of all of us moving forward. Page 141. Democracy requires bold and continued advocacy by those who believe in it. Now, George Washington set a fantastic example. He resigned after two terms as president because he wanted to be sure that people understood that we should not be giving our obeisance to a person. It should be to, to the principles of democracy and also not as he mentioned, to a political party. <laughs> Last chapter, The Road to Freedom, on page 151. In his 1863 Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln envisioned a new birth of freedom, rising from the ashes of the Civil War that took more American lives than any war before or since. Yet Lincoln, who recently had lost his own son, so beyond the sorrow of the moment to a time when democracy would make everyone free. So if he had lived, he would have worked on reconciling um, both sides in the Civil War because that was always his vision. Page 155, with all of its difficulties, for those who believe in democracy, there only is one side. We choose the universal respect of human rights to ensure our own. So if we believe in human rights, when we believe in the value of human beings, if we respect others and insist on those rights for others, we also are ensuring it for ourselves. We don't know what the ultimate picture will be. Perhaps there only will be a continually changing and challenging world. The struggle has been going, been going on from the beginning between autocracy and, and oh, I should say autocratic and democratic elements, and uh, it could, probably will continue. We do know that cooperating with others toward common solutions is preferable to submitting to subjugation in thought or action. The entire history of humanity can be summarized as a struggle between autocracy and democracy. This struggle continues every day in our personal and politi political lives. It is about whether to succumb to what we are told to believe and follow or to take the less certain path where we consider for ourselves what is likely true and thus best serves us. The former, autocracy, is easier. The latter is strewn with pitfalls. So the question is, what do we choose? On page 161, on March 4th, 1865, Lincoln gave his second inaugural address before a huge throng gathered outside the US Capitol. Rather than focusing on blame for the destruction of the Civil War, he emphasized the task of rebuilding. He demonstrated the attitude required for healing to take place with malice toward none, with charity for all. And last on page 199, at the end of the Civil War, Lincoln insisted on lenient terms for Lee and his officers, allowing them to return to their homes rather than imprisoning them which was to their surprise. So he not only talked about compassion and understanding toward others, he demonstrated that 
every chance uh, that he get, got. So I'll just, I'll say this, that the anti-demic forces are winning around the world because they are bold and follow the easy path. That is why it is essential for those who believe in democracy to act more boldly to defend human equality. But if we only engage in blame, we're not gonna convince everyone. That becomes a circular firing squad. It's about us versus them when we do that. So democracy is not about us versus them. It's about focusing on the vision we all hold for the world in which we want to live. We must discuss that democracy is about human rights and respect for everyone, including those with whom we disagree. The struggle always will be ongoing. Democracy only can be defeated if those who believe in it concede. Thanks for listening. I wanna add one more thing. Uh, if you do buy the book, I'd appreciate your writing a review. Thanks again.